May I request that those who are leaving the chamber, both in the public gallery and on the floor, uh, to do so quietly, please. Thank you. And the next item of business is a members' business debate on motion 3302 in the name of Liam Kerr on the Awards for Valour Protection Bill. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Liam Kerr to open the debate around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am very proud to be standing here bringing this members' debate today. And at the outset, I'd like to pay tribute to our greatly missed friend, Alex Johnston, for whom this issue was especially important. Uh, and as such, it is an even greater honour for me to pursue it. I also thank those from across the chamber who added their support to the motion, allowing us to debate what is an important and for many a very emotive issue. There are few things that we as a country should value more, nor people we should honour more than those who volunteer to defend us and our way of life. It was on the 10th of March, 1816, that the London Gazette carried the following memorandum from Horse Guards. The Prince Regent has been graciously pleased in the name and on behalf of His Majesty to command that in commemoration of the brilliant and decisive victory of Waterloo, a medal shall be conferred upon every officer, non-commissioned officer, and soldier of the British Army present upon that memorable occasion. And from that day forward, it has been the proud tradition of this country to present medals to our servicemen and women when they are judged to have been deserving of one. And be under no doubt, the requirements <clears throat> that qualify British service personnel to be awarded a medal are some of the strictest in the world. It is an honour earned, not gifted. When someone serves their country, they do so not for honour or for glory, and certainly not for riches. But when that person has served on active operations, when their unit, their ship, their submarine, their aircraft has spent time in a hostile land or waters, when they've shown valour in the face of the enemy, it is right that we do honour them, that we make clear to them the thanks of a grateful nation and award a medal. Which is why such a high value is placed on these medals in this country, not only by the service personnel themselves, but by their families. For many who have suffered as their loved one has been injured or made the ultimate sacrifice, or who want to show that they still remember the sacrifices of previous family generations, the medals are a solid, unbreakable reminder of that person, of that duty, of that sacrifice. It may come as a surprise to many that the wearing of medals or insignia that one has not been awarded or as a tribute to family with intent to pass them off as one's own is not already a crime. It certainly surprised me. The fact is that between 1918 and 2006, it was. Winston Churchill, then Secretary for War, introduced legislation making the unauthorized wearing of military medals a criminal offense. However, since the enactment of the Armed Forces Act 2006, it has not been an offence for an individual to wear medals or decorations not awarded to them in order to deceive others. It was felt <clears throat> by the government of the day that provisions under the Fraud Act of 2006, which make it an offence to make financial gain by fraudulent representations or by <coughs> using an article such as a medal to commit fraud, would be sufficient. However, the widely held belief since by the government, the armed forces, the veterans community is that it was not enough that it did not work. And indeed, a survey conducted last year by the Naval Families Federation of people in the armed forces community found that 64% of respondents had personally encountered an individual wearing medals or insignia, uh, insignia to which they were not entitled. And that is why Gareth Johnson, MP for Dartford, has introduced the Awards for Valour Protection Bill to the House of Parliament. It will make the false wearing of medals or insignia or any award for valour conveyed by the Defence Council of the United Kingdom with the intention to deceive an offence punishable by up to three months imprisonment or a fine. The bill is of vital importance. As a Defence Select Committee of the House of Commons report said, the deceitful wearing of decorations and medals is a specific harm which is insulting to the rightful recipients of these awards, damaging to the integrity of the military honour system and harmful to the bond between the public and the armed forces. And we, as Scotland's Parliament, should show our support for this bill. If we do not, if we do not make clear that these medals, these awards are important, sacred even, to those who have won them, 
and their families, then what value are we actually putting on them? Since the end of the Second World War, a, pe uh, a period we often call peacetime, 7,145 UK Armed Forces personnel have died as a result of operations in medal earning theatres. Those who risk their own lives for our safety and our security should never doubt that their elected representatives will always wholly and unequivocally support them and support the honour and pride with which they wear their medals. In May 2011, the Scottish Government gave its support to the Armed Forces Covenant. It is a pledge that as a nation, we acknowledge and understand that those who serve or have served in the Armed Forces and their families should be treated with fairness and respect in the communities, economy and society that they serve with their lives. And for this reason, the Parliament should give its support to the Awards for Valour Protection Bill. Deputy Presiding Officer, every November, we remember the hundreds of thousands of men and women who, in the uniform of this country, have made the ultimate sacrifice to defend our country and our way of life. And right now, servicemen and women continue to serve us with all the risks entailed. So let us send a signal from this chamber that we hold their work, their commitment, their devotion to duty in the highest possible regard. Let us send a signal that this place recognizes that medals and awards should only ever be worn by those who earn them and their families. That we too back Gareth Johnston's awards for Valour Protection Bill. And let us once more reaffirm our pledge to forever honor and support our servicemen and women, their families, and our veterans. Thank you. I call Colin Beattie to be followed by Maurice Corey. Speeches of around four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Firstly, can I thank Liam Kerr for raising the awareness of this issue in the Scottish Parliament, and in particular in terms of the Awards for Valour Protection Bill. The awarding of medals in recognition of acts of bravery and feats of courage and endurance in the service of our country is an important and sincere recognition of this service. It is right that those who are awarded such medals be entitled to wear them with pride. Those of us who live a civilian life rarely have the opportunity to recognize and acknowledge those members of our society who have fought bravely on our behalf. It is also right that there should be a form of protection to ensure only those who were awarded medals and family members in their honor have the right to bear them. The tradition of awarding medals for valor dates back many centuries. The Romans were known for having developed a sophisticated system of honours for their legions back in the first century BC. In England, medals were awarded on the orders of Elizabeth I to naval commanders who defeated the Spanish Armada, while Charles I issued the very first gallantry and distinguished conduct medals during the English Civil War. Given the depth of this history, it is unsurprising that measures were taken during the First World War to prohibit the unauthorised use of medals. Winston Churchill, in his role as Secretary of War, set the argument out quite clearly when he remarked, we want to make certain that when we see a man wearing two or three wound stripes and a medal, that we see a man whom everybody in the country is proud of. The UK was not alone in taking this approach at that time. Other countries who imposed similar legislation included Australia, Canada and New Zealand. Where the United Kingdom differs from these countries is that their provisions are still in force. In the UK, no specific offence relating to the unauthorised wearing of military decorations has been in place since 2009. It was that year that saw the introduction of the Armed Forces Act 2006, in which the relevant sections of the Army Act 1955 were dropped, according to what the Ministry of Defence claimed were uncertainties arising from the way this act had been drafted, part of the concerns relating to cases where an offence had been committed without a fraudulent basis, in other words, if someone had been wearing a medal but made no attempt at financial or property gain, in such cases the MOD stated it would be likely in practice to cause difficult questions of proof. Since 2009, there have been varying reports on the levels of deceitful use of medals. The Royal British Legion has stated that such incidents are rare. The Royal Air Force Families Federation suggested the problem was not widespread. On the other hand, a survey from over 1,000 members of the Naval Families Federation found 64% of respondents had personally encountered individuals wearing medals or insignia belonging to someone else. This is not to speak of the work of the Walter Mitty Hunters Club, a Facebook group set up to identify and expose military imposters. In the light of this, in its work examining the awards for, the, the awards for Valour Protection Bill, 
Westminster's Defence Committee came to the conclusion that there is a body of strong anecdotal evidence that points to military imposters being a continuing problem. The committee also recognised that the way the public view war veterans may be negatively affected if the problem is not addressed, and distress could be significant to families who have lost honoured loved ones during a conflict. So what should a, what should a suitable punishment be for those who commit to deceive or defraud the public for their own material gain? The provisions entailed in the bill allow for a fine or a period of imprisonment not exceeding three months. Previously, you may recall the 2010 case of Roger Day, who, while attending a Remembrance Day parade, wore no fewer than 17 medals, an SAS tie pin and bury, none of which he was entitled to, resulting in a community service punishment. Mr Day may feel he, he was lucky he wasn't sentenced under the Awards for Valour Protection Bill, although perhaps he could have been subtler given that most of his fellow Remembrance Day attendees were displaying two or three medals each. While the bill is clear in its exemptions for those wearing medals as part of historical reconstruction, live entertainment, or in honour of the family member entitled to the medal, there seems to be an assumption that those who do not fall into this category are automatically acting in a nefarious manner. And I would hope that sensitivity and understanding will come into play when we judge those arrested under the bill's provisions. These reservations aside, I welcome the progression of the Awards for Valour Protection Bill and look forward to seeing the positive effect it will have on members of our armed forces and their close families. I call Maurice Corey to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First of all, I commend Liam Kerr for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. Those who serve their country in the armed forces give up a lot to serve their country. Many will go to dangerous parts of the world and face great personal risk there. They give up precious time with their families to go on operations abroad or at sea, sometimes for months on end. Many have made the ultimate sacrifice in the service of their country, which Abraham Lincoln once described as the last full measure of devotion. We recognize their sacrifices in different ways, since 2006, Armed Forces Day is celebrated every year in late June to celebrate the work of those currently serving. We have remembrance memorials in every village, town and city in the land, and every year on the 11th day of the 11th month we take two minutes to remember our fallen. We also present medals to those who are judged to be deserving of recognition. We present medals uh, for different things, some recognize the individual for their participation in a military campaign, such as the Iraq Medal for all the Operational Service Medal for Afghanistan, the former Yugoslavia, the Falklands, and Northern Ireland. Others are given for participation in humanitarian missions, such as the Ebola Medal for Service in West Africa. Some receive them for long service and good conduct, such as the Meritorious Service Medal. We also give medals for acts of bravery and valour, our country's highest award being the Victoria Cross, which is given for valour in the face of the enemy. They are not mere trinkets, they matter. They are representative of the thanks and the gratitude we have, we have in this country for what they have given to us. Often the men who receive these awards will not speak of themselves, though, and what they did to deserve them. They will tell you that they aren't really a hero, but they will talk of their comrades. They will tell you why it is them who deserve the recognition and the thanks of the nation, because they were the real heroes. And that is why those who serve in the military find the so-called Walter Mitties so offensive, because they are taking credit without making the sacrifices that their comrades have, because the Walter Mitties haven't given anything to deserve the praise and thanks of our country. And that's why I support fully the motion put forward by my colleague Liam Kerr today and the bill which Gareth Johnson, Member of Parliament, is presenting in Westminster shortly. People who are actively and consciously trying to deceive people into thinking that they have served by wearing medals and honours which they haven't earned are harming the reputation of the real active service personnel and veterans. This, I believe, in turn, will end up harming the work of veterans' charities who do so much to help support our veterans' community here in Scotland. I do believe that they should be punished for their deception, and I do believe that the punishments as laid out by Gareth Johnson in the Awards for Valour Protection Bill are appropriate. 
So I hope other members will join me in encouraging our colleagues at Westminster to support Mr Johnson's efforts. Thank you. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Bill Bowman. Thank you very much and uh, I too congratulate Liam Kerr on bringing this debate and uh, bringing it forward today and he was of course right to say that addressing this issue was something close to the heart of our late former colleague Alex Johnson in the North East and I know Alex were he with us uh, would indeed uh, be delighted that this debate was happening today so uh, I would want of course to take this opportunity Deputy Presiding Officer to add my tribute to the work of Alex Johnson in this and in many other fields uh, over the time uh, that we served together uh, representing the North East. It is one of the privileges of a member of the Scottish Parliament, indeed members of Parliament and other uh, people in public life, to take part in the annual remembrance mentioned by Mr Curry of those uh, who have served in our armed forces over the years and to do so on behalf of the wider community. And in, in the North East, one of the largest such events is at the crematorium uh, in Aberdeen. And it has been impressive to see uh, the, the, that the number of, ser of units of the services which have taken part in that have not diminished over the years, but actually increased uh, uh, most recently with the Gurkha Regiment now being represented at that event. And like uh, my colleagues from other parties, I have always been struck on these occasions by the importance of both medals for valour and service medals that are worn by veterans who are now in civilian life, uh, because those are a signal and a sign uh, of the service they have given and, and a, a token of the respect in which that service is held. And as Mr Kerr reminded us, those medals are earned and therefore uh, should be recognised accordingly. It is therefore important to underpin that recognition by making clear that unearned display of such medals is simply not an acceptable thing to do. And so the purpose behind this debate, I think, is very broad support. The purpose is clearly right. Honours need to be honoured, uh, and in order for that to happen, they need to be protected. I would add only two caveats, neither of which takes away from the central thrust uh, of, the, of the motion before us. First is the issue of family members who may choose to wear the, rel the medals of a relative who is deceased or incapacitated. Now, I do recognise that that point is addressed in the bill to which uh, this motion refers, but nonetheless, it's an important point. Like no doubt many other members here, uh, I have the custody of my father's service medals from his service in the Second World War uh, and thereafter in the Territorial Army. And I, of course, recognise that they are mine to keep and not mine to wear. But I think it's important that we acknowledge that for other people, that might not be self-evident uh, and they may uh, choose to wear medals in a way that is inappropriate, but they may choose to do so uh, with the best of intentions and with no intention to disrespect. So I think that's an important point to, to keep in mind. Edward Mountain. Thank you. Uh, just, just to be clear, <clears throat> It's entirely right and proper that family members uh, should be able to recognise the service of family members and, and it is customary uh, to wear them on the opposite side of, of the chest to the ones that are, who have actually earned them. So, and, and I don't think that this bill seeks to criminalise that and I think it, it, it's important that we as a parliament accept that that's a right that, that we should encourage. Lewis Macdonald. The point, is, the point is, is, is well made, but in a, in a sense that emphasises the point that I'm seeking to make, that uh, uh, we may know the uh, protocols for these things, but we shouldn't assume that everybody does, and we should therefore be careful uh, not to punish those who inadvertently uh, cross a line. The other point I would mention, with your indulgence, Deputy Presiding Officer, is the, is the point made by former Marines Captain James Glancy, which was that those guilty of this offence uh, may often be people for whom uh, whose mental health is the cause of, of, of their choice to make that, take that action. Uh, I, think, I think we would all agree, and there's an increasing body of uh, consensus of opinion, that people who are uh, uh, suffering from mental illness, for them prison is not often the right solution. So I hope that in this bill being taken forward, that that will be borne firmly in mind by those responsible uh, both for setting penalties uh, and indeed in due course for enforcing the law. But with those caveats, uh, Presiding Officer, I am delighted to welcome uh, this motion today. And the last of the open speeches is Bill Barr. Um, thank you. Bill Bowman. 
<laughs> it's a day for mixing names, I think, yes. <laughs> um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. You'll perhaps forgive me if I ever refer to Mr. Speaker <laughs> in circumstance. Um, let me start by congratulating my colleague Liam Kerr on securing this debate and bringing it to the Chamber this afternoon. As already been mentioned, the issue we're debating today is one that was championed by Alex Johnson and in my um, personal circumstances, I'm particularly pleased to be able to take part here today. The system of honours for valour that we have in the United Kingdom and the ones that exist right across the world are one of the ways that we, as a country, honour the men and women who put, who put or put themselves in harm's way to protect both our security and uphold our, our values. The selfless acts of bravery and courage that we hear about make each and every one of us proud of them and I'm sure all members will agree that it is right that they receive the proper recognition for their efforts. It is therefore fundamentally wrong when some people wear these medals to inflate or make up claims about serving in the military or protecting their, their colleagues. Not only does it undermine the system, it takes the shine off those who have served and in many instances given their lives while protecting our country. Today's motion refers to Gareth Johnson MP's private members bill currently going through the House of Commons. That bill specifically sets out that a person who with intent to deceive is caught wearing or representing themselves as being entitled to wear a medal or honour for valour, whether awarded to a member of the military or a civilian is guilty of an offence. And here I'm open to be corrected by I understood it's not just military awards that are covered by the by the bill but there are civilian ones such as the George Cross so I refer to not only military people but to those who um, give up their lives potentially for their country but it is the act that intent to deceive which is important as has been mentioned, I welcome the protection in Mr. Johnson's bill for family members who wear such medals in honour of their late relatives. Um, I think Lewis MacDonald said that he uh, was custodian for his families. Unfortunately, I have not been able to find so many in my family. I, my father has the Burma Star, which um, I think is, is one I take some, some pride from. We have all attended events on occasions such as Remembrance Sunday, Sunday and spoken to people, maybe even know people who wear a late, family, a late family member's medal and they do so with pride. In my view, they have every right to do this and I believe that affording them the necessary protections to continuing wearing these medals is important and I think we all agreed that perhaps with, it needs to be made clear that uh, how to do it, the protocols. I look forward to monitoring the progress of Mr. Johnson's bill through the House of Commons. It is one that I support and one that carries cross-party consensus. Not only does it make it a criminal offence to wear a medal when you haven't earned it, the point of the bill, as Mr. Johnson pointed out, is to protect genuine heroes. Deputy Presiding Officer, as elected politicians, we have a duty to support those who serve our country, be it in the armed forces, on the front line or as civilians or in the police, fire, rescue services, they are the bravest and the best. This bill is a further way of protecting their efforts and I want to pay tribute to Mr Johnson for introducing it into the UK Parliament. Thank you. I now call on Keith Brown to close this debate. Around seven minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and uh, thank you also to Liam Kerr for securing this debate and for the positive contributions of members from across the political spectrum. Um, I think I heard uh, Bill Bowman say this was his maiden speech. Was that right? In that? I think it's a, well, I, in any event, I think it's an entirely appropriate time, given, of course, that he's replaced uh, Alec Johnson in this place for him to uh, make that, uh, that speech. I had a number of conversations with Alec Johnson about this issue. He felt, I think it's fair to say, as well as raising the substantive issue, he was quite understanding of some of the UK government's concerns about it, but he thought it was extremely important that the issue itself uh, was aired and raised in this parliament, and I think he was uh, entirely right in that. Scotland's uh, veterans are an asset to society. We are tremendously grateful to them for their courage uh, and service to their country. 
Uh, I know from my experience that we learned uh, in training of somebody called Corporal Thomas Peck Hunter, who was the, I think, the only Marine in the Second World War to gain a Victoria Cross. It was about four years later before I first met his nephew, John Swinney. Um, it's interesting, though, that the Victoria Cross, having been awarded to Corporal jo uh, Thomas Peck Hunter, it was so valued by the Corps uh, at the Royal Marines that it was part of basic training that you learned about the achievements of somebody having received that medal uh, for valour. And uh, on another point, to underline uh, the extent to which these things are important, I uh, have campaigned for many years, along with others in this Parliament, for the award of medals to the Arctic Convoy veterans, um, which was uh, subsequently, after many years of campaigning, um, achieved. Uh, and again, uh, medals for uh, what Churchill, I think, called the most difficult and treacherous uh, journey uh, during the course of the war for what they did. So certainly there was valour involved in that. And also one of my own constituents who came to me, he had seven medals. The seventh one had been posted to his base after he had left it, had therefore gone missing and had a very hard time trying to get that replaced. I think uh, Liam Kerr referred uh, to how uh, strict, um, perhaps it, it, it was uh, another member, uh, as to how strict the conditions are. And he could not get his medal replaced. And we did manage to achieve um, uh, the replacement of that medal uh, through the help of Marc Francois, who was the UK uh, Veterans Minister at that time, who was also very helpful in relation to the Arctic Convoys campaign. I mention these things because that, the latter uh, person that I mentioned, when they got that seventh medal, the effect on that person was huge. Uh, attending remembrance uh, services afterwards, he now felt he had all the medals that he was entitled to. It had a huge uh, impact on, on him. As has been mentioned, competition for some of these medals is intense and the qualities required of nominees for such recognition are extremely high. Um, as we've heard, also, this was championed by uh, uh, Alec Johnson, and I would again congratulate uh, Liam Kerr for taking this forward, continuing that uh, debate, and welcome the opportunity that we have because of that to debate this today. Um, I would point out, as I think members uh, are aware, that this uh, subject is covered by uh, Westminster. It's a, uh, proposes an action to remedy the issues members uh, have highlighted lie squarely with uh, Westminster. I understand that the UK bill passed the committee stage yesterday with cross-party support. I know two of my colleagues, Kirsten Oswald, who speaks for the SNP on veterans matters at Westminster, and also Brendan O'Hara, who is her defence spokesperson, also uh, spoke in support of that, and that a report will be submitted to the House of Commons to the wards at the end of this uh, month. Should the bill receive assent, its provisions would apply across the UK, uh, so I'm glad that we would have the opportunity in advance of that to discuss this today. Uh, there are, as we've heard, occasional stories in the press about people who falsely wear medals or other military insignia for a number of different reasons. Thankfully, I think as we've heard from Colin Beattie, uh, many of the organisations that work most closely with veterans have said these incidences are rare. Uh, some of the people who do this uh, seek to mislead. Some, uh, I think, are simply fantasists. And some have, as I think as, as Louise MacDonald rightly says, have some underlying issues that require to be addressed. Uh, in evidence to the Commons Defence Select Committee, the Royal British Legion said that such conduct is rare and not widespread. However, the behaviour does damage the integrity of the military honour system, and I share the frustration felt by many members of the public who want to honour those who truly deserve it. And I think the point that's been made about making sure, I think as Edward Mountain has mentioned, that people are aware of the conventions. There's another example, for, I think it's the Elizabeth Medal, which is now um, a, awarded to families uh, of uh, those who have died in service. And I'm aware of one instance where um, the sister of somebody who was killed uh, in war um, had asked uh, somebody else to wear it on her brother's behalf. The ceremony was 8,000 miles away from where she was. Although that was a medal awarded to somebody else other than the person that uh, actually carried out the act of valour. And I don't think we are seeking to catch that kind of incidence. Um, but uh, it just points to the fact that there are some complications. I think, again, as Lewis MacDonald mentioned, I think it's, it's fairly uh, safe to say, as others have mentioned, that these honours are not given out on a whim. They are awarded for bravery and meritorious actions over and above what is required in the usual uh, service uh, of one's country. They are highly prized by those who receive them, their friends, families and comrades. And ahead of the debate, my officials contacted the Scottish Veterans Commissioner, Veterans Scotland, Poppy Scotland and Legion Scotland to canvass their views on whether they believed, as we've heard from the Royal British Legion, uh, that this was a common, uh, prevalent or a major issue in Scotland. And the consensus reply was that, thankfully, as I've said, the incidence of such actions here was low. 
and those who do behave in this manner are not treated in their views as a threat, more of an, an annoyance or an irritant, with usually, as has been mentioned, other challenges in their lives. But for those, again, as Colin Beattie mentioned, to deliberately create a false impression for gain, uh, which is a reprehensible thing to do, uh, the Scottish legal system is robust enough to take the appropriate action. Uh, for those few individuals who seek to access support from veterans' charities, it's reassuring that those cases are, by and large, quickly weeded out. Uh, we have to bear in mind that in these cases, individuals may still be in need of charities uh, so that charities can ensure those cases, uh, uh, charities have to ensure those cases are sensitively handled and directed to appropriate services. And it's worth remembering that many family members of those who served, as we've heard, wear their medals to honour their memory. And that's a very important custom. Uh, and not all family members will be aware of the convention, which uh, Edward Mountain has uh, clarified for us in terms of how uh, to do that. They will do that if they do it wrongly in error uh, with no um, prospect of gain or trying to uh, gain kudos. They do it simply because they would be unaware. And even mentioning it today and further clarifying it helps to make it uh, more prevalent that people be aware of that custom. Uh, I do have some concern that uh, the legislation could have the unintended effect of deterring family members from wearing medals uh, through confusion over the change in the law, and that's why that clarification is so important. The, that argument that it might cause confusion was previously used by the MOD uh, as a reason for not legislating on this uh, matter. But in my view, it's important that the issue is considered fully during the passage of the bill, and the provisions, once they are agreed, should be properly communicated to the wider public uh, and also offer reassurance to family members who choose to wear medals in honour of their loved ones. Uh, Presiding officer, I welcome the support voiced here in the chamber for safeguards to protect the integrity of the military honour system and to ensure that all those who have been awarded such tangible symbols of our thanks uh, and esteem are rightly appreciated. Thank you. This meeting is suspended until 2 o'clock.